good morning, and uh, God has given us another beautiful day, a great day to, to uh, worship Him. I hope we've been able to spend some time together at, at home, worshiping God. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we get to the, to the passage and to the sermon. Uh, you may have noticed that we did not have Michelle playing uh, the prelude like we have uh, the last number of weeks, um, and that's because... Um, is, is with her mom right now. Uh, Michelle's mom um, is having some severe back uh, pain right now, and so Michelle's with her mom. We're trying to figure out what, what to do. Um, so she's not here, which also means that we were planning as a family to um, lead you in the song of response to doxology. We will not be doing that this morning, so hopefully you can um, finish that up on your own at, at home with the song that's on the order of worship, the liturgy. Uh, one thing, I did make a mistake on there. It, it says that that song, which is in our new hymnal, is to the tune of uh, Jesus Shall Reign. Uh, that's wrong. It's not to the tune of Jesus Shall Reign. It's to the tune of Shout for the Blessed Jesus Reigns. Um, I got those mixed up, so um, hopefully that's a familiar tune as well. And if, if you don't know that tune, uh, just read through those, those words as a way to morning. Also just want to uh, talk just briefly about reopen. A lot of, um, well, a number of you have asked me and asked some elders about when are we going to open our doors again for, for corporate worship and um, I'm just asking you to, um, to be patient and to be in prayer. The, the elders will be meeting this week to talk about um, what that will look like for reopening, when and how. They have a lot of things to think through, and so they are uh, desperately in need of, of the leading of, of God's Holy Spirit um, and, and wisdom as they make these decisions. They are not easy decisions to make. And um, so please be, be in prayer for our elders, especially this week as they, as they face some of those questions and certainly get the word out as soon as we have anything decided on, on what uh, that will look like for reopening. I invite you to grab the Bibles and we'll turn to Acts chapter 2. That's where we're, we're sort of camping out for a while. We're doing a series of promises for the last time. And this series is simply going through uh, this one chapter, Acts chapter 2, a beautiful or a great chapter of the Bible. And uh, one of the things that that means is that we're really digging deep into this chapter. And I know that, that a lot of you uh, watching this, uh, listening to this, you might not have a lot of church background, uh, might be, uh, you don't have a lot of Bible knowledge. And so sometimes when we're really digging deep, uh, maybe some of this is, is hard for you to understand. It might go over your head, and that's okay. That's fine. Um, I'm just going to ask you again to, to be patient this morning as we're going through some of those really deep things because uh, hang in there. When we get to the end, the core message I think is, is understandable by all and it's certainly applicable. Um, it applies to everyone. And so um, if there are parts where you're just not, not sure what's going on, that's okay. Just, just hang in there. Uh, until we get to the end, and we trust that God will speak to you through his word. So, Acts 2, starting in verse 14, verses 14 through 21. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. 
The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Now let's, let's bring ourselves back to the, the setting here. This is the day of the, the Jewish feast of, of Pentecost and and Jews from all over the world have, have gathered together in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is packed with Jews. Jews who, who live there, Jews who have traveled there. And uh, the, the disciples are also all together in one place. And suddenly there, there is a, a, a sound, a, a mighty sound of, of a violent wind. And then there's these tongues of fire that appear and, and rest on, on each one of the disciples. And then these disciples begin to, to declare the wonders of God in languages that they've never learned. All empowered by the Holy Spirit. And, and the Jews are, are confused. How, how can this be? How is it possible that, that all of us Jews who are from all over the place are all hearing them declare God's wonders in our own native language. How is that possible? And the question they ask is, what does this mean? But then there are some who say, doesn't mean anything. That's just a bunch of drunk fools. And then we see in verse 14, Peter is standing. Now, most likely he was already still standing, and, and what this, this word is, is trying to say is that Peter took his stand. He took his stand with the eleven as, as the representative of these twelve apostles. And he's going to speak on their behalf. Now, that in itself is amazing. This is Peter. Okay, now, you, you remember Peter? Uh, think of Peter, and we think of the times where he was, he was bold, and he liked to, to really run his mouth and talk a big line a lot when he was with Jesus. He was tough in his talk. But when it came down to it, a little servant girl asked him, don't know what you're talking about. And in fear, in fear, Peter backs down. And it's that same Peter who out of fear for what would happen to him because he belonged to Jesus, who now takes his stand as the representative of these apostles. And he's not going to back down. No matter what these Jews say or what they think about him. And I want us to, to think too about one other time, one of the things that, that Jesus had, had said to Peter that, that I think really makes this event, this moment in Acts 2 pretty significant. Maybe you remember when Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they said, well, you know, some say that you're uh, John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're one of the prophets. And Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter stands up again and says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, that, that's right, Peter, and, and that was revealed to you, not by man, but that was revealed to you by God. And then Jesus goes on to say, I'm going to tell you that you are that name means the rock. You are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now, now that statement has been misused by, by the church uh, throughout, throughout ages, um, misused to claim that, that Peter was the, the first pope, and that um, from, from Peter comes this succession of popes until the present day. And that's not what Jesus was saying. We, we 
can't go into all of that right now, but, but think of what think of what Jesus was saying to Peter. Peter, I'm going to take you and this confession that you just made of who I am. I'm going to take this, and I will make this. You and your confession will be the foundation, the rock upon which I will build my church. And here we have, in Acts 2, Peter, the rock, taking his stand as the representative of these apostles, and he is going to preach the very first Christian sermon. And that message of that very first Christian sermon is Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it's from Peter and on that message that Jesus Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not Peter takes his, his stand. And he takes his stand, first of all, to simply answer their question, the question of the Jews. So they're saying, what does this mean? And he says, listen carefully. Listen carefully. These men are not going to choose the boat. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. And it literally, it says it's the, it's the third hour of the day. And that would have been right around nine o'clock. And, and he's just saying, it's, it's fairly early in the morning. These men would not be drunk already. But, but probably also, and maybe even more uh, important, is the fact that this was a special feast day. Remember, this is Pentecost. This is a Jewish feast day. And on that feast day, the Jews, the devout Jews, were not supposed to eat any meal until the fourth hour of the day. This is the third hour of the day. They would not have eaten anything yet. And Peter's saying, they're not drunk. It's only the third hour. So if they're not drunk, then what, what explains all of this that's going on? Well, Peter says, well, this. And, and he's talking about what, what, what you see here, what you're experiencing, what we're all experiencing here, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This, what, what, what you're seeing and what we're going through is exactly what the prophet Joel talked about. Now, just a, a side note here. One of the things that we see from, from Peter's sermon uh, is that Peter goes right to Scripture. His sermon, and we'll see this throughout the, the rest of the sermon too, his sermon is an explanation of Scripture. And that's what a sermon should be. Sermons are not pastors giving their, their greatest insights, their greatest thoughts about how to, to have a better life, or how to be happier, or or just how to behave better. It's not pastors giving inspirational talks. Sermons should be a declaration, a proclamation, and an explanation of Scripture. Digging into Scripture. What is God saying here? And, and, and seeing what God says to us in Scripture, and then beginning to apply that. That's what a sermon ought to be. That's what we see from Peter's sermon. So when, when we evaluate sermons, and we all do, be honest, you're doing it right now. You're evaluating the sermon that you're hearing. And when we evaluate sermons, the question that we should start with should not be, well, how does that make me feel? How does the sermon make me feel? Did, did it do anything inside me? Does it do anything for me? Did it give me good things to do? That should not be the question that we start with. The primary question is, was God's word open to us? Did he declare the word of God? And did he show us Christ? This is what Peter does 
in his sermon. He preaches, and his text is from Joel chapter 2. And, he, and he's saying to these Jews, he's saying, what, what you see here going on is exactly what Joel was talking about. So here's a, another thing that we have to keep in mind, is that we have to understand how the New Testament writers quoted the Old Testament. Remember, Peter's talking to Jews. They knew their scriptures. What we call the Old Testament, that was their scriptures, and they knew them well. So when, when Peter's quoting from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, they would have known the context of those verses. He wasn't simply thinking about those five verses. He's thinking about the whole context around those five verses, and the Jews would have known them. And that's why, if you're following our, uh, our Bible reading plan for the year, then this past week, you know that we had you read Joel chapter 2, the entire chapter, three different times. You read Joel chapter 2. To, to try to get us to understand not just what the, do these five verses say, but what's the context of Joel chapter 2. So, so what is it? I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, God is saying in Joel chapter 2, he's, he's saying to his people that there will come a day called the, the day of the Lord when he will bring judgment on the disobedient. But then in light of that that judgment that he's talking about with the day of the Lord, he says that this is also a call to repentance. Repent and come back to the God who is, is loving and, and gracious and merciful. That is what the, the day of the Lord is all about. It's, it's an inauguration of the kingdom of God and God will bring judgment as his kingdom comes but he will also rescue his people who turn to him in faith. And, and Joel then goes on in the verses that Peter quotes here. Joel goes on to say that one of the signs that, that this has happened, that the day of the Lord has come, that, that this judgment and call to repentance has, has come, is that the Spirit of God will be poured out. And that's Precisely what Peter is saying. He's saying, you see this? It's happening. The, the wind, the fire, the, the speaking in tongues, it all shows that the Spirit of God has been poured out. And, and when we know that the Spirit of God has been poured out, we know that, that what Joel was prophesying, what God was saying to Joel, it's now. These are the last days. That's what Peter was saying. You see, the, the last days, the, the last times, are not simply the last few days or weeks or months right before Jesus comes again. The last days were started with Jesus' life, death, resurrection, last days, the last times will now continue, continue until he comes again. Jesus Christ has brought the day of the Lord. Jesus Christ has ushered in the kingdom and he has come as king. And we know that that's true because the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all his people. Okay, so let's Let's, let's consider what, what Peter says here and, and what Joel uh, says in these verses. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Now, what's the emphasis in those verses right there? A lot of times when we read this or, or when we hear it, the emphasis is on the visions and the dreams. You know, your, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. You know, it's like there's going to be this amazing stuff that happens, this crazy stuff that's, that's just out of this world. That's what's, what, what this passage is saying. That's not the point. That's not the point here. Okay, now, stick with me. we got to go deep here. We have to think about the way the Spirit of God worked in the Old Testament. 
talked about this last week too, that the Spirit would come on specific individuals, giving them a specific task to do. And, and most often, that task, or that, that when the Spirit would come, the Spirit was empowering that person, that specific person, for prophecy. To, to know and to understand and then to proclaim the word of God and the will of God. And, and for those prophets in the Old Testament, that would come through special revelation. How would they know God's word? How would they know what God wanted and who God was? Well, that would come through visions and dreams. God was, was teaching these specific individuals who he was and how he would act, his plan of redemption. So who, who would prophesy? Who would see visions? Who would dream dreams? Well, it was only these very specific people that, that God gave his spirit to so that they, very specific people, would be the ones to prophesy. A very special people out of all of God's people. Pouring out of the Holy Spirit is not 
It's not primarily about having amazing experiences. It's about salvation. It's about rescue. When, when Joel prophesied these words, he was saying there's judgment. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming against disobedience. Judgment is coming on sin. Judgment is coming on sinners. Judgment is coming. But there will be a rescue. God will provide a rescue. And everyone who repents, everyone who turns from their sin and cries out to Yahweh will be saved. Listen to what, what God says in, in Joel chapter 2, just verses earlier, verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. In a, a few weeks, as we continue in, in this sermon from Peter, Peter calls the people to repent. Very specifically, but that's actually the point right here. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, check this out. Check this out. Look, look at verse 36. This is so good. Verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both, and what's the next word? Lord. Lord and Christ. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord, this Jesus, this crucified Jesus is Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. All those who turn from their sin, all who repent, all who cry out to Jesus, saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. Nothing in my hands, I pray, I have nothing in me to save me. I need you, Jesus. I need your death to count for me. I need your righteousness given to me. I need your resurrection applied to me. I need you, Jesus. Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved, will be rescued. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. This promised Holy Spirit, he brings you to repentance convicting you of your sin, showing you the ugliness of the sin of your heart, and then showing you the beauty of Jesus and Him crucified. And we've talked about this before, but I think it's, it's worth repeating. What is God doing with this a judgment on specific people for specific sins? Absolutely not. And we have to be so careful with how we talk about the judgment of God in connection with what's going on. When we start pointing the finger and saying, well, see, it's because people are like this. We, when we look at specific communities and say, well, well it's because that community is, is like this. That's why they're suffering so much. Listen, listen to Luke 13, verses 1 through 5. Now, there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners 
than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I'll tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died from the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Jesus is saying, you see these, these tragedies that have happened where Pilate killed these Galileans and mixed their blood with the sacrifices. You see the, the, the Tower of Siloam and it fell on these, these 18 people and you want to say, well, they must have done something wrong. God was judging them, and Jesus says, no, the point was not to bring judgment on those people. The point was to remind us all, every single one of us, that judgment is coming, and we all must repent. Do you think that those who are suffering from COVID-19 are worse sinners than anyone else? No. But it's meant to point us to the coming ultimate judgment. There is going to be judgment. That was the message of Joel. But there's also rescue. God is rescue for those who repent. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. This is for all of us, for every single one of us. What we are living through is a call for us. Repent. Repent. Turn from your sin. Call on the name of Jesus. And you will be saved. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is, is at work in you this morning. And is convicting you of your sin. Repent. Would you please talk to, to, to another Christian. Talk to a friend. To a parent or to a neighbor or, or to an elder or to a pastor or contact me. If the Holy Spirit is working in you and convicting you of sin and, and you need to, to turn and repent, but most importantly, call on the name of Jesus and you will be saved. Judgment is coming. But here's the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful news. For those who
only rescue. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for making a way, for giving us Jesus as our perfect substitute. Thank you for salvation that comes through him. Lord, if there are any who are hearing these words who do not know you, who do not belong to Jesus Christ, Lord, send your spirit to do that work. after we're done here to uh, spend some time with the, uh, the song's response, even if you just read through those words, that would be beautiful. Um, and then you can sing the doxology together at home. But um, let me give you the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace.